Game On Magazine is chatting to Peter Dupree, an exceptional athlete and uh, possibly an even better man. How are you today, Peter? No, I'm great. And yourself, Dan? I can't complain. Thank you. Peter, you, uh, you have, uh, you've, you've set the record books alight and uh, we're very excited to be speaking to you today. Let's start off with, for the, for the guys that don't, understand, that don't know, how exactly did you become a quadriplegic? Okay, so uh, it happened on 6 October 2003. Um, I was actually at that point, I, I finished my degree in actuarial science and I was busy doing my honours um, in investment management at the university, of, well, it was then Rao University. Um, but I was also sort of semi-professional athlete um, on a sports bursary. Um, so it's an ironic story. I, I had a 60 case of cycling to do on the day and I had a bit of a hamstring niggle. So somebody told me about a chiropractor I could go to. Um, and the chiropractor was 30 k's away, so I decided I was going to cycle there and back. And then um, I, on the way to the chiropractor to get my spine in alignment, um, a car didn't see me and it knocked my spine completely out of alignment. So, um, yeah, so then uh, ended up, uh, went to one hospital and then ended up in Union Hospital. Um, and I was in ICU for about 42 days. Um, I was on a ventilator for 32 days. I lost my sight for two weeks or control of my eyesight for two weeks. Um, but yeah, then after 42 days, I was finally ready to go to rehab as a C6 quadriplegic. Um, and yeah, I don't know if I should explain what C6 quad means. Um, should I do that? Uh, yeah, tell us tell us what your disability entails. Okay, so I mean, just for those that don't know, quadriplegic doesn't mean you can only move your head. Quadriplegic means all four of your limbs are affected. Um, so depending on where you break your spine or your neck, neck rather, um, you could have only head movement or you might have some arm function. So I'm a C6, which means um, function-wise, I only have wrists, biceps, and shoulders. So I've got no hand or finger movement. Um, and I also have no tricep function or no functional tricep function. And then I'm completely paralyzed from my chest down. Um, and also don't have um, a lot of feeling. I, I'm sorry, incomplete, so I've got a little bit of feeling, but, um, but very, you know, I can't feel pain or um, heat or cold or anything like that. So. Yeah. Well, to, to, to do a quick comparison, I'm a C4-5 quadriplegic, and I basically just have my biceps. Also, no uh, no no feeling of hot and cold, and no feeling below my, my nipple line, if I can put it like that. So yeah, um, we are cut from the same cloth in terms of our disabilities, but you, uh, you managed to carry on with your sporting career. Was it a, a case of that you just loved the sport so much that you went back to it, or was it just something to keep you active? Didn't you have any worries? I mean, you are doing, you are cycling on the road, which is what led to your accident. So, um, yeah. Look, I mean, first of all, for me, it's a case of when you fall off a horse, you get back on it immediately. Um, but no, for me, um, you know, look, I'm a man of faith, so, um, in, in a weird way, I think I was born to be a quad. Um, it sounds very weird when I tell people this, but I've never had a bad day of sitting in this wheelchair since my accident. So, um, you know, I've, I've, I'm really blessed from, and it's a lot of grace from above, um, and blessed with a lot of support. So, um, you know, in a sense, I just feel maybe this was fate and this was supposed to be. Um, but yeah, in terms of going on and doing the same sports, um, for me, sport was, was a lifestyle for me. So, you know, it's a love and a passion. And um, already in rehab, um, a good friend of mine is actually now my coach, told me about paraplegics doing triathlons, um, which was my real love um, as a sport before my accident. Um, so, you know, in the back of my mind, I thought, well, maybe I can be the first squad to do a triathlon. So it was always in the back of my mind. I started doing sport, um, playing wheelchair rugby and so on. Purely because, you know, being a quadriplegic or any spinal cord injury is a physical thing. So the stronger you get, the you know, the better conditioning you can get your muscles in, the better you can do your activities of daily living, you know, so it, it really goes hand in hand for me. So, so out of that perspective, it was obviously good to carry on with sport. But for me, you know, sport is a lifestyle and it was part of my life. So for me, it was naturally just going to going to happen. I was going to get back into sport, you know, so, you know, in terms of doing the same sport again, you know, a lot of people told you it's not possible to swim as a C6 squad. You won't be able to push far in a racing chase. But for me, you know, those type of things just spear me on even more, you know. So, yeah. so I'm glad that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, by trade, uh, Peter, you are an actuary. And 
you know, before we get into the other nitty gritties, I myself is I, I, is unsure what a, um, what an actuary is. So, what exactly is it that you do for Deloitte as an actuary? Okay, so I mean, typically Deloitte's actually a CA firm, accounting, um, but so I work in the actuarial consulting side. Um, and what actuaries do? Um, we basically, you know, a lot of times it, a lot of people think it's just life insurance and maybe general insurance and working the insurance. Um, but um, I work in the general insurance team, but um, I actually work with motor plans mostly. Um, so I do projections, um, future projections of the um, costs of motor plans. You know, so typically a guy buys a car and he's going to, you know, as part of the price, um, uh, you get a motor plan on top of it. Um, and then obviously in future, he's going to come in for services and maintenance on his car. So I look at every single car in the fleet that, it's, that still has an active motor plan and project what the future cost is going to be. And then they can compare whether the fund that they have currently will will sort of match what, what the future cost is going to be. You know, So that's just one part of it. But I mean, in general, actually work with life insurance, um, doing you know future projections, looking at pricing, um, Valuing liability, you know, it's a lot of financial and mathematical and statistical type of models and things. You know? oh. Well, I'll take, my, what we do. I'll take my hat off for you because uh, numbers has never been my strong point. Um, so uh, I'm glad that uh, there are guys like you out there that's doing that for us. Peter, um, <laughs> one of one of the things, I mean, you, you are working for Deloitte, but uh, just, just if in case our readers don't know, but it will be below the article in his list of achievements. Peter holds world records, African records, South African records. He um, was the first quadriplegic to do an Ironman, which is considered the most intense triathlon out there. Um, how does your training work and how are you able to be a, a professional athlete and still be able to work for a firm like Deloitte? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, firstly, you know, when I started working, um, you know, at that point in my life, I, for me, it was a thing of getting independent and financially independent and moving out of my house, my parents' house because when I broke my neck, I moved back into my parents' house um, to start off with. Um, so I first wanted to get, get those ducks in a row before I start taking sports seriously. Um, so obviously, I, if I can say, I paid my school fees at Deloitte. You know, then I worked many hours, full days, etc. But I mean, Deloitte has been incredible. Um, you know, the team I work with, my boss, etc., you know, in supporting me and supporting my sport and sort of making it work and, and almost evolving with me as my sport became more important and evolved. Um, so, you know, currently I work three quarter days. Um, so I spend, spend about six to seven hours in the office only on a daily basis. Sometimes I work from home, you know, depending on what client, etc. I'm on. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, especially when I'm training for the Ironman, you know, I, I physically sometimes get up to 35 hours of training in a week physically. Um, so that would, could possibly mean that I'm spending about 40 to 42 hours on training, you know, driving to places where you go, getting ready, getting dressed, etc. And I mean, then we're not even starting to talk about the recovery and trying to get some rest in between it and so on, you know. So, so it is hard, but I mean, it's a lot of time management. Um, but I've got, also got an incredible wife. Uh, I think obviously you know her, Dan. Um, yeah. And yeah, I've, I've really blessed. Uh, you know, it's great from above that that it just happened. But, um, I, I don't think I deserve her. But anyway, the point is, it's, it's all of it is really a team effort um, with a lot of time management. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to do it without her. You know, so so it's definitely teamwork. Um, my company, Deloitte, supporting me. Um, the team that I work with also allowing me to be flexible. Obviously, also a lot of good planning, you know, so if I know I'm doing certain races in the year, I can, you know, I let them know as long as I can in advance so we can plan which projects I'll be on, etc. You know, yeah. so, but being said, in the end, um, you know, the, you, you need, you've got a certain number of targets, billable hours that you need to eat every month. So for me, um, you know, the deal is if that starts, um, you know, not correlating, or you know, if I don't meet the target anymore, the uh, expense arrangement. You know? so, but currently, things are going well. The last two, three years have been, you know, great. So, yeah, yeah you know, but I mean, Lloyd also sponsors me quite a bit throughout all my journey. So, I mean, I'm very thankful for them as a firm. Yeah. Well, um, just so our, our viewers know, we uh, Peter and I know each other th through Elsa, his wife, who happened to be my OT when I first broke my neck. 
Um, so she is a phenomenal woman, and um, uh, she, she, I think she is a big reason for a lot of your success. Um, yeah, but but moving on, um, Peter, what does your training actually entail? You do do a lot of hours, as you just said, but what type of training mm -hmm. do you do? You do gym work? Are you mainly on the bike all the time? What exactly are you doing? I mean, so because I'm a triathlete at heart, um, uh, you know, I almost always do all three, swimming, cycling, and running. Um, but I also think um, they, you know, they, they, it's, it's a mutual relationship between three sports and the cross training is very good for each other. Um, but I also do do some gym exercises. So I, I used to be at a gym, but now I um, sort of just do my own training at home. And sometimes I do go to the gym where I swim as well um, and do some gym training once or twice a week as well. Um, but the gymming at this stage for me is more conditioning and um, it, it's for injury prevention and, and just conditioning the muscles yeah. and, you know, strengthening the muscles that's weaker. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, what does it entail? So, I mean, depending on what I'm focused on, um, you know, typically if I'm training for Ironman, um, I mean, then you're training for a race where you swim 3.8 Ks, cycle 180 Ks and do a full marathon all on the same day. So, I mean, it's a lot of hours then. Then I would swim anywhere between 10 to 16 kilometers in a week. Um, I would cycle somewhere between 17 and 20 hours in a week. Um, I would be on the racing trail between six and eight hours in the week. And then anywhere between two um, half an hour to hour sessions of gymming as well on top of that. So, so I mean, it's, it's a lot of training. Um, but I mean, as I say, if, if I'm focused on, say, world champs or cycling or focusing on marathons or athletics um, like I am now, I typically only hit between 20 and 25 hours um, of training. Um, and currently, maybe I'm only swimming two swim sessions in a week. So maybe doing like six to seven kilometers of swimming um, because it's not that important. So it's more for injury prevention that I'm swimming and just general strengthening. Um, and then I focus more on the racing gym, on the bike. You know, so. Okay. Just just, bef just before we get more into your sport, when I was going through the information that Ilza sent to me, she, mm -hmm. she mentioned in there that you also suffer from a congenitive eye disease uh, yes, I, yeah. I never knew that of you and I mean I've been following your story ever since I became a sports writer and even before that what exactly is it and she said that it's, it's actually going to prevent you from competing at some stage what is the projected yeah. um, time timeline for that it's a difficult question to answer in terms of timelines um, but just to explain it it's called choroideremia um, and it's a degenerative eye disease I only found out that I actually had this degenerative disease um, quite late in my life. Um, I was always night blind as a child and struggled to see at night. Um, but, it, you know, th that was all part of it. So it's a, it's a gradual thing and you, you're, you're, um, you, it's a degenerative thing. So you gradually just it gets worse and worse. Your retina starts dying away. Um, so I must say, look, currently I've already lost central vision in my left eye um, and my peripheral vision is really bad in both eyes. Um, so, I mean, if I look for myself at how it, it, it's going backwards, um, I don't know if the next Paralympics will see me, if 2020 will see me compete, um, unless maybe I have like a cyclist cycling with me, um, you know, and just making sure I, I know where the corners are, etc. But, but I mean, it, you know, I could wake up tomorrow and then my central vision, my right eye is gone, and then it's too dangerous for me to be out there, you know. So already, um, you know, it's affecting me already, even in, in daylight, um, going from, from sun into shade. Um, so, I mean, some of the marathons I do, I really go and drive the courses three, four times before I actually race it. Most of the cycling courses on the World Cups, I always, um, you know, go and cycle it and look at it on Google Maps, etc., and study the courses because I, I've already got a disadvantage in terms of my eyesight. Um, so, yeah, you know, it, it, it's, it's bad. But it's something I knew that was coming for a long time. So it's not like when it comes, so be it. Um, so, yeah, for sure, competitive sport is going to stop because there won't be a blind quad division, yeah. for sure. I will always be doing sport, like swimming. I do double on backtrack. I'll have a guy swimming with me. And, I, you know, I've got lots of plans for if I do go blind, I can't do competitive sport anymore. I'll always do sport. But then I'll focus on adventure stuff and, and more on ch doing charity things, you know. So. Yeah. so you've got a plan for your life, uh, depending on yeah. when it happens. Yeah. It's just all about when it will happen. But you do have a, yeah. a backup plan. And as, I mean, for me, as I say, grace from God, like I think one of the gifts for me was just to adapt and just carry on. 
So when I broke my neck, I adapted and I carried on. If I lose my eyesight completely, I'll adapt and carry on. You know, for me, I think that's just the gift that I was given. So, so be it. You know, it's definitely worse for me that I'm going blind than being quad. Because as a quad, I can still be independent and live life. Yeah. I'm going blind. You know, independence is gone. You know, so I mean, that's the for you. I mean, uh, you know, you don't have your wrists, and that, that's the big difference between in, being independent as a quad and not. I mean, so for you, you know, you know, yeah. sometimes. It's, Sucks not being independent, and, and, and that's why I've got a lot of admiration for you guys as well, you know. Yeah. Which is I positively. Oh, you know, so. Yeah, I just got to carry on. We are not dead yet. Um, exactly. Peter, to get back to your sport, um, you are a triathlete at heart, but I've, after speaking to able bodied triathletes, there's always a discipline of, triath of triathlons that they, in, that, that they enjoy and that they are good at. And then there's one of them that they're not too good at and they don't like doing it. What's the case for you? What do you like to do? What is your your favorite part of a triathlon? And what, what part do you actually have to work on in order to to be a, a competitive triathlete? It's quite weird. Before my accident, swimming was definitely my, my Achilles heel. Um, but I did work hard on it that season before I broke my neck. Um, but, I, you know, my cycling and, and running was almost equal strength um, beforehand. Um, so, but running was always my favorite. And I think in the same way now, um, running, which is the racing wheelchair, is definitely my favorite. It's the hardest, um, the toughest, you sit in an uncomfortable position. But if I hit my rhythm on the day, it, nothing can beat it, you know. So that's definitely my favorite. But in terms of being good in both, I mean, I'm world number one in cycling and, and wheelchair racing. So, you know, for me, which one I'm better at, I can't tell you because I think I'm really good in both. Um, I mean, quite funnily enough, you know, the, there's no quads competing in swimming and long distance open water swimming, really. So, um, but I think swimming now as a quadriplegic, I'm, I think I'm equally good. So, I think my things are in all three. I'm, I'm really good in all three because, I've, I mean, if you look at the times that I'm swimming these days, it's, it's pretty impressive. But I think it's almost the same. You know, maybe I would say swimming is my worst. And it's definitely the one that you, if you put list for it on the day, uh, you know, it's cold and it's the one you, you enjoy the least. But, I mean, I, I do enjoy it. But least, yeah. yeah. Peter, um, just a quadriplegic question. Just to just to ask a question about, I have seen some of your photos, and, and we have included a photo for the article, where you sit in one of your racing chairs where it looks like you're sitting directly on your bum. Your knees are quite close to your face. How do you prevent, yes, yeah. how do you prevent pressure sores by sitting in a position like that for so long? So, I mean, that's the most important thing of all is to make sure about pressure and that you've got padding where you need padding, etc. And also, if you have a new chair or a new position in a chair, do not go out and do five hours in that position without checking it regularly. You know, so normally if I try a new position or a new bike or a new chair, um, I would normally go on it the first time for half an hour or an hour and then, you know, get out quickly and check the pressures and see is it okay is it red is it this is it that so that i know where i need to put extra padding um so i mean yes that's that's very very important for anybody listening if they're starting off you know to make sure that um you, it's a slow process of you know, getting long hours in and make sure you check um and then as i say after you've checked you know where to put padding or to change your position yeah. to make sure that you get the source so but then you know nowadays i don't change my position all that much so normally when I get a new chair and I change something it's a small change so I would already immediately know will it make a big effect in terms of pressure or not you know so yeah. I've learned a, a, and tell a me uh, are you able to do pressure relief when you when you in your chair yeah you know Dan what what naturally happens on the road especially um, is there's always some um, you know the road surface isn't always smooth etc so there's always a little bit of bumpiness or, you know, I don't explain it, um, friction. Yeah. So that actually does help for pressure. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, can, I can't lift up my bum completely, but the way I push, you know, I can lean a little bit more forward with my head or lean a little bit backwards, then it definitely changes the pressure on my bum. Um, but the way I sit, the pressure is actually more on my, um, on my uh, shins. So it's actually my fins that I worry about the most and have special padding in front, check them off the long hours. Uh, my bum, actually, if you see how I am in the chair, actually takes the least amount of pressure. So, okay. 
Well, that's very interesting. Have you ever had to miss a race or a competition because you've gone on a training run, a training run and you've got redness and, and it's not going away? Um, I must say, look, I, I'm, I must say I'm very good with it, but, you know, I, since I started being a quadriplegic, I was always very, um, you know, tent to, to pressures and that type of thing. So I'm very fortunate I've never had a serious injury or pressures or anything preventing me from going to do a race. So, um, no, but I mean, again, that could just be a lot of grace from above as well. So, but no, you know, I've, I've, I've looked after my body very well. Mm. Um, and to be honest, now recently I bumped open my shin, um, getting out of the indoor trainer, I a spasm um, while in, your, in the indoor trainer on, on my bike. Oh. And it just opened up a little bit on my shin, but the, the bad part about it was it's exactly where my shin is on my racing team. Oh. So I actually, for three, four weeks, finding different ways of putting plasters and extra padding and a sponge, etc., tape and so forth, um, for that wound to actually heal. But that's my thing. Like I'm so scared of pressure sores that this thing isn't even close. It's a very small wound, but I'm already like freaked out about it. So I'm just so super careful about it. Yeah. So. Well, to the able-bodied, to the able-bodied guys that are watching, uh, basically what a pressure sore is is. What happens, anybody can get it. It's not just for, for, for spinal cord injuries, but basically what happens is that the, the blood gets stuck between the skin and between your, between your skin and your, a bone. So it's generally your bum or your elbow or your knee or your ankle, anywhere where the bone is close or the back of your head. And if you don't do pressure relief, what happens is it becomes a sore. And when it become, if it becomes a sore, then you're already screwed. It's off your bar, it's off that area for extended period of time. And that's why I keep questioning Peter about it because if he gets a pressure sore on his bum, he can't sit, which means he can't train, which he basically can't do anything. And I'm talking from experience because last year I got a pressure sore that required flap surgery, and I was out mm. for six weeks. I wasn't allowed to sit up, which is very frustrating if you're an active quad. You don't. You know, and especially where we live in Gauteng, where the weather is generally pretty decent in the winter, or in summer as well, and we want to be out there doing stuff, and we're stuck in a bed looking at a white wall and a white ceiling and maybe half of a window. So it's very it's very important, and that's why I keep asking Peter about it. But moving along, um, you've done a lot. I mean, Peter, you've done a lot, but... You know, you started somewhere, and when you started, there were people who started with you. You know, friends, family, your wife, now. Who has been your support base? So, I must tell you, um, Ilza was actually in a, in a life group, like a Bible study group with my older brother. Um, so, Ilza is my wife, just for everybody. Um, so, um, when I was still in a coma, she came to the hospital to tell my parents, because she was an OT, you know, sort of what they can expect um, to happen. She wasn't my OT, but I always say we literally met by accident. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, you know, to be honest, since then, we were friends, etc. And I think she always says we do some motivational talking. She always says, um, because I told her I'm going to be independent. She's never seen a C6 squad being fully independent. That's the reason why she stuck around. I'm just glad she stuck around because, um, yeah. to be honest, she was there to support support taking me to wheelchair rugby and everything from the start so um you know even before we we've got married or started going out she has always been there um so obviously she's my number one supporter um but i mean i've also had many friends i've got a good friend walter luch who's doing the iron man with me um and i mean obviously my parents was there you know during my accident my, my period where i was just you know, getting independent in terms of activities of daily living, they were there all the way for me. Um, great support. Um, subsequently, my mom's passed away. But, um, you know, in terms of that, they were always there. But in terms of sport, um, it's definitely more Ilza and, like, friends like Walter Lutz, Dennis Weapon, uh, good friends of mine. Um, Bjarke van Amaro, who's my boss at Deloitte, as well, we like his friends. Um, he's always been there for me. Um, and, you know, when I need a guy for a race, uh, you know, any triathlon or anything where they need to second me or just come help out or whatever, you know, they're always willing to come out. So, they're great people. You know, you, you become an inspiration to a lot of athletes. But as an athlete yourself, you will also seek to find inspiration. Are there any athletes within your own field or outside of outside of outside of what you do, or even, you know, guys who are not even athletes that you look up to, that you, you get inspiration from, motivation to push that little bit extra? Yeah, look, I mean, I love many different sports. Um, 
And I mean, I've got very uh, many guys that I like. You, you hear what they say and look, read some of their biographies, etc. But I would definitely say, um, you know, it's crazy. The guy who's coaching me now, uh, Raynaud Disson, uh, he's now retired, but he used to be a professional Ironman athlete. Um, and I started training with him a little bit before my accident that last year. Um, so he was actually the guy who told me about the paraplegics that does Ironmans. Uh, but he was always like a big idol for me, just the way he approached sport, attitude, etc. So, um, so Renard Tissick is definitely a, like a big idol for me in sport. Um, and it's amazing for me that um, we're now friends and he's my coach. Um, but then also there's a guy called Heine Kubele, a German guy, um, who still holds the marathon world record. But he's now 69 years old, I think. Um, and he still holds the marathon world record. Um, and I mean, we're also friends. I, my first training camp that I went to, um, I looked him up and, um, you know, I, I went to a training camp in Germany um, uh, where he was. Um, so he's also a guy that that I, I really look up to, you know. So, um, but I mean, then there's many guys that's, that's big idols for everybody uh, in sports, you know, like, uh, so, I mean, there's many guys that I, that I learn from and, and take a lot from, um, but those are the two that's my heroes. Yeah. Tell me, um, Peter, You've been all over the world. I'm not even going to attempt to name all the places you've been to because I'm going to list half the countries in the world. Um, where's your favorite place to race? Where's the favorite place you've been? Sure. Um, look, I, I have to say that the first place, the first marathon that I did was Berlin Marathon um, in 2008. So that was my first wheelchair race overseas internationally. Um, and subsequently, the last four years, I've won Berlin Marathon the last four years in a row. So... Berlin is a special place for me, um, so definitely Berlin. Um, but then I somehow always also have great results in Switzerland, um, and I love the people there. So so it's going to probably be a close call currently between Switzerland and Berlin, um, Germany, you know, but Berlin specifically, and Switzerland, not well, um, specific, not well in Auburn, but, but the whole of Switzerland. But um, I've got some special memories from those two places. Um, yeah. I would say those are my favorites. <laughs> yeah, well, you are definitely safe to say you're a Europe boy through and through. <laughs> yeah, you can say that. <laughs> um, talking about Berlin, you were recently in Germany, actually this, this past Monday. You were in Germany for the Lazarus Awards. You were nominated for sports sports persons with a disability. You unfortunately didn't win, and the whole of South Africa was rooting for you. But um, yeah. Yeah, talk us through that. Talk about... How, how did you yeah. find out about the nomination? We, talk us through the actual event, yeah. being there with some of the best players. I mean, you were there with the New Zealand rugby team who, who yeah. won. So there's a lot of there's a lot of stories there. Talk us through it. So Okay, so just sorry to correct you, but it's actually the Laureus Awards. Um, ah, Laureus. The Laureus World Sport Awards. Um, and yeah, just for those that don't know, the Laureus World Sport Awards is literally the Oscars for sports. Um, so I was nominated in the category for sports person with a disability, but I mean, then you've got sportsman, sportswoman, breakthrough of the year, um, comeback of the year, sports team of the year. Um, so, and I mean, to be a finalist, so they, they, they choose six finalists in each category. So um, you know, to be a finalist um, nominee is, is incredible, you know. So if you go Google anybody who's ever been nominated and, and being, being a finalist in the Laureus, um, then they'll, it'll say um, nominee at for Laureus. Even if you didn't win it, that, that will normally be underneath the guy's name. Um, so that's how big it is, you know. So for me, it's been, you know, over the last three, four years, you know, a lot of, I mean, obviously I've trained hard over my whole um, life, but um, the last three, four years it really picked up and, you know, a lot of effort went into everything for me and my wife. Um, so, um, you know, and, and obviously... We, we weren't lucky when it came to the SA Sports Awards for some reasons. Um, but, um, you know, then ending up being the only South African at the Laureus Awards, which is, you know, the world stage, as I said, for, for sports uh, awards. Um, it's just such a huge honor. And it, for me, I'm so proud of South African, you know, so to go represent um, my country um, and go represent quadriplegics because, I you know, for, for our sports disability class, I was also the first um, quadriplegic um, hand cyclist and wheelchair racer um, that I know of that, that was actually nominated for it. So so I think it's a little bit of a sort of breakthrough for us. Um, and yeah, it was just a huge honor. And I mean, the event is surreal. Um, you know, we all stay in the same hotel. Laureus flies you over. They pay for everything. They pay for your hotel. Um, and then, I mean, you go up the lift with Boris Becker, come down with Brian Banner, running to Richie McCaw in the lobby, 
look over your neck and there's Figo, you know, like it's, you know, it's just unreal. Um, so, I mean, it, it was huge fun and it was a huge honor to, to be there. And um, yeah, congratulations to all the guys who won the awards. Um, in the end, I think anybody who is a nominee could possibly have won it, uh, you know, like the way they all deserve to win it. Um, so, you know, in the end, the guy who wins it, well done to them, um, you know, I take my hat off. And, yeah. you know, it was a little bit of a disappointment not coming back to South Africa with the award, but you know, it's it, you don't feel robbed. You know, it, in the end, it, it's just a huge honor um, to have been there. So it was great. No, no, it's uh, well, South Africa is proud of you, um, and uh, the quadriplegics of South Africa are especially proud of you for um, flying our flag high, not only in South Africa but overseas. Peter, you know, you've you've achieved a lot, but out of all your achievements. What, what, what is your favorite? What is your most cherished achievement? Look, I mean, yeah, you know, as you say, I've achieved a lot. I mean, I'm a, a three-time world champion. I've won in cycling. I've won medals at world champs in athletics. Um, uh, breaking a world record is special. So, uh, so there was three moments that brought tears to my eyes. You know, I don't cry often. The one was when the first time I became world champion on the bike. Um, and then when I broke the 10,000 meter world record last year, um, that was really special because if you understand the conditions and the heat and yeah, it, it was just, it was incredible. Um, but definitely I think the highlight, the one that can't be topped, you know, you, you can break a world record, but somebody else can break it as well. But the Ironman, I was the first quadriplegic and there's two quadriplegic classes, um, quads with triceps, quads without. So, I mean, I'm in the weaker class. Yeah. And I'm the guys to the point. I'm still that guy, and now I've done three. But to do that first Ironman, um, and I mean, to be the first world in history can never be taken away from me. You know, somebody yeah. can go faster, but they can't be the first to do that. Um, yeah. and I think in most people's eyes, it's still impossible. You know, they, they don't believe that I don't have triceps, you know, etc. So, but I mean, what made it more special was the fact that six weeks before I broke my forearm in three pieces. I had an operation, I got a plate put in, on the day it was still broken, and I went on and I still did it, you know, and um, yeah. so it, it was almost like a miracle on the day. So, I mean, that is definitely the most special day, and I, I think the, 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 a moment that I'll cherish for the rest of my life, and I think what my wife and, and Walter, the guy who raced with me on that day, uh, you know, we will never get that day. Yeah. You know, you, you just mentioned something now, and I just want to talk about it. You said that there's people who believe that you don't, that you do actually have triceps. Do you get a lot of that, a lot of scrutiny for your achievements? Do they think that you're lying about your disability? I must say, not the guys that know me. So, I mean, the guy, so on the World Cup circuit with hand cycling, for instance, all the guys have seen me and they know I'm a true T51 and I fight for our class. In, in athletics, actually, there's five guys currently racing on the athletic circuit that's not supposed to be in our class. So, and we're all fighting against them. So, I think in general, the quads that races with me, they know me. But it's the guys that look at a picture and, you know, they wonder about it. But then when they meet me, uh, they can clearly see, oh, there's no question about it. Um, yeah. So, I mean, and I mean, I've got, I don't find any issues with that because me myself, um, would look at a guy doing something and doing it fast and I see a picture and it can be deceiving um, but I've just learned that you you know you can't judge the book by its cover you need to know the guy and make sure etc so so I, don't, yeah, I wouldn't say I get a lot of scrutiny directly but I know indirectly what I hear via people etc sometimes um, then I know the, the guys wonder but for me that's uh, almost like um, how can I say I, I feel it's a for me because they they just don't believe it so it means they just believe don't believe it even more you know so yeah. when they do see it's real then it, it, it's more of a surprise or it's more amazing for them then so so be it you know yeah well i know exactly who you are and what you what you've lost so uh, people who scrutinize you can uh, come chat to me if they have a problem with it because uh I know exactly, and I will uh, give up. A, I'll give up one of my arms just to be able to do what you are able to do, um, Peter. You know, just now, well, now that we're ending off, you know, a big question is the Paralympics in, in later this year. Your, what are your goals for the Paralympics? So I mean, that's that's where the whole funny part about fighting for my class and fighting for events, and especially fighting for endurance events, comes in. Um, cycling was at Paralympics. Um, 
it was on the program for two years. Um, and our class opened up only after the previous Paralympics in 2012. So there was no cycling for H1, um, our category, in 2012. So it was open, and then suddenly at World Champs last year, they told us, sorry, there was an administration issue, so IPC is not allowing us to race anymore. So, you know, in a certain sense, there's still a little bit of discrimination. I feel, you know, if you go look at their reasons, it's, it, to be honest, it's bull. Um, there's no reason why we shouldn't have been there. Um, but unfortunately, it is what it is, so cycling isn't there. Um, so now the only events for me will be on the track, athletics track, and once again, it's only 100 and 400. It's only the sprints. Um, and as I said, racing against some of the other guys who um, there's a lot of question marks about whether they should be in the class, especially in the sprints on the starts is where they have that advantage because they've got some triceps. Um, so, you know, my focus will be on the 400. Um, and, uh, you know, I've qualified probably eight times already, eight qualifiers for 100 and 400. Um, but in the end, getting to the Paralympics, it's about your rankings. Um, and my rankings was great last year. I was ranked in the top five and every race I did, I placed um, and I raced big races last year in the 400, um, broke the African records in the 400 numerous times last year. So everything was looking good. Um, but then unfortunately, again, for some weird reason, team selections, I wasn't um, selected to go to the world champs last year, um, being ranked higher than many athletes that did go. So. You know, it, it just made my road to Rio extremely hard. So now, um, you know, it's a, a fight for me to actually just... I don't know surety that I am going. Um, so that's why I'm doing a lot of athletics races this year. Um, and I'm doing another couple of races in of May in Switzerland, which is a good um, um, hunting ground for me. So I'm just hoping to get some really good times there to get my ranking up again. And I um, mean, then I've done what I can do and controlled all the controllables I can control and then you know, it's up to the selectors to choose me or not. So, so be it, you know. Um, so I'm hoping I'll be there. I mean, obviously, every athlete wants to go to the Paralympics. Um, and um, Rio is a big dream. And winning a medal, I, I honestly believe I can medal in the 400. Um, but, um, you know, if it doesn't happen, I'm still chasing the world record in the marathon. Um, I actually, the Sunday before the um, Laureus Awards in Berlin, I raced the marathon. It was the most incredible marathon of my life, actually. Um, so, uh, you know, um, everything is looking good for me in terms of anything else. So if it doesn't come through to go to Rio, there's always other things on the cards. So. Yeah. When, when, will you, when, when is the latest that you can qualify for Rio? Well, I mean, as I say, qualification is not an issue for me. Um, I've qualified many times already. Um, so in, in terms of, I think they announced that that's also a black box at this stage, but I'm expecting that to announce the team like previous years they announced it somewhere between middle june and middle july so i'm guessing it'll be around there. Um, but i think to play it safe um, you need to be sure that you've got all your your races and trying to get your best times in before middle june i would say you know that that'll be a guess middle june end of june so so i mean it's all about trying to get good rankings and come middle june that your rankings are in, in, a, in a really good position so we'll see what happens <laughs> Peter, you know, now that you've done so much and you have achieved so much, what do you have left on your bucket list in terms of your sporting career? You see, I mean, that's the thing for me. I always say if you set a date, it becomes a goal. Otherwise, it stays a dream. Um, and I also say that once you've achieved a goal or a dream, then you move on to the next one. And I mean, be sport being a lifestyle, whether I go blind or not, completely blind, not completely blind, whatever, there's lots of goals and lots of mountains for me to climb. Um, so, you know, for me, I still believe that um, on the right day, on the right course, I can do a sub-12 hour Ironman. So um, that's definitely on my bucket list. Um, another one is to do Kona. Um, and Kona is, is a really hard race. And us quads, they don't sweat at all as well, low blood pressure, not getting our heart rates up. Um, the heat in Kona is incredibly hard and tough. Um, and the daylight um, is very short there as well. So it's tough for me in terms of my eyesight as well. Um, but I want to go do Kona. Kona is like, it's the world champs. Um, for me, that's another one on my bucket list. But that one, even if I don't do it on my own and I do it while I'm blind in a tandem bike and a tandem racing gear or something, I'll figure a way out to do it. Um, yeah. So that's on the bucket list. And then also for me, why well, I've shifted it for a bit from the, the island the the British Channel, um, but as I said, swimming I can do while I'm blind as well. So you know that one I'll, I'll 
worry about until I go blind. Yeah. Uh, sorry, we just had a break. We had a break in transmission there. So what what, oh. what Peter was saying was that the last thing on his bucket list is to swim the the uh, the, the British Isle between what is it the British Channel. So you would like to yeah. be the first quad to uh, to swim between France and or between Britain and France. Uh, Peter, in closing, mm. what would you say to uh, young quadriplegics who, you know, because a big thing with quadriplegics, what I've seen is that you either accept your disability very quickly and are able to move on, or you don't, and you sit at home and you mope. And So for those guys that are sitting at home and not, who maybe are too scared or too, uh, too afraid or you know, too shy to, to get out there. What would you say to them in order to get back into sport? Well, I mean, I would definitely say, you know, when you become a quadriplegic, paraplegic, um, it is a physical thing. So some guys weren't very sporty or physical beforehand and they don't enjoy doing sport, but it changes your life to do sport because it gets you out there and it, it creates a little bit of freedom. Um, cycling on the roads by yourself, you know, it, it just creates incredible freedom and it, good for your mind so first of all i'll tell them get involved with some type of sport because you know this, the fact that you get stronger helps you on your daily activities or helps you figure out doing things that you couldn't have done um beforehand um but yeah i mean what could i say to them as well first of all you know for me it, same thing applies able body quadruple doesn't matter if you've got a goal or a dream um or something that you're working towards doesn't help sitting and waiting for it. You need to make it happen. It starts within yourself. So first of all, even if you as a quad need somebody to help you to do something or build something or whatever so you can do what you need to do, you still need that person or need to make them or get them to help you. It starts with you, you know. So so that's a very important thing for me. And, um, you know, then, yeah, it's, it's just for me to, to have a goal and a dream, to write it down on a piece of paper sign it like a contract and share it with your friends your family or the people who's close to you and i always say as i say put a date to it because then it becomes touchable almost you know and um, even if you don't reach the date or make the date because of certain circumstances i promise you're going to be a hell of a lot closer to it than if you never put down that date um, mm. and the reason why you share it with family and friends is because they keep you accountable so it's me those tools that helps me um and I mean, the last thing I would say is, you know, your mindset, you know, you're one mind shift away from a solution to any problem, I believe, you know, and um, obviously, you know, they can look at what I've done and hopefully that will show them, geez, you know, I can do an Ironman, so maybe they can transfer on off the bed if they've got the same function, you know, because if that guy can do an Ironman, you know, it's just, you can really live a quality life and so much more is possible than you can perceive with your mind. But you need to start trying and trying and trying. And then maybe one day when you open your eyes, you know, you're there. So, um, you know, lastly, I would just, my favorite sentence is when a bad thing happens, it's an opportunity to be great. And that's just what I'm talking about, you know. Yeah. Yes, you're in a bad situation, but you can absolutely turn it around and make it something great. Yeah. So, but, but once again, that's a choice you need to make inside you. you know? yeah. So no one else can do that for you. Peter Dupree, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. We at Game On Magazine salute you and we support you in your road to Rio. All the best with uh, the rest of your sporting life. Um, we are definitely going to chat to you again when you um, when you break another few of your bucket lists. When you when you do that conus in sub 12, we'll have another chat. No, for sure, man. Keep Thanks so much for the support, Dan and, and Game On, and um, yeah, appreciate appreciate the chat. It was really fun. Thanks, Peter. Keep well, man. Well then, cheers. Let's pipe.